Welcome to another edition of Warbird Wednesday. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. I am not Francis Scott Key uh, or George Washington or any of those guys. Uh, they've got me uh, done up in, Kevin, this is the strangest hat I think I have ever seen. So I'm going to go ahead and get this one off my noetic assistant. We'll toss that off camera. Thank you so much. Now, today we are continuing down attack uh, helicopter lane, and we took a detour with the 181 uh, last week. And the reason for that, I got some feedback. The reason for that was the genesis of a lot of this anti armor stuff started with those really slow fixed wing airplanes. And I wanted to take a moment and really kind of delve into that and the background. Now, what happened. We've gone through kind of the rudimentary helicopters, and I'm going to pick up a Cobra here. This is not what we're going to talk about to fill my hands, but we're going to talk about the MI-28, the Havoc. Cry Havoc and let slip the dogs of war, a mill product, of course, a Russian aircraft. Now, the, but what happened was you really had a divergence in helicopter design. The MI-24 still could carry troops, and it was still a flying tank, but it was kind of straddling both sides. But what ended up happening is after the war, and we're going to get into American, uh, really American designs deep into them in here in a bit, but the armor and maneuver, maneuver warfare, high-speed warfare, we've talked about um, air mobile moving air enemy uh, or troops behind enemy lines, but mobile warfare really came to the front, the forefront. And in Europe, where both sides thought the next war was going to be fought, where the Russians were going to flood the Fulda Gap through there, the Allies uh, were going to, NATO was going to try to stop them, there was a very uh, pronounced effort to provide close air support uh, for these actions. Now, it came in two directions. One was these attack helicopters, which basically evolved into these just killing machines. They, they're no longer transport. You had transport, you had cargo, but you had a faction now that it evolved into very aggressive um, uh, killing machines. I, it's the only way I can describe it. They were primarily to go after armor and uh, troop carriers, either the troop carriers of NATO or BMPs at the Russians on the other side. And that's where these attack helicopters, and they still live to this day, uh, they're still running around and we're going to talk about them, but that's where the divergence took place. It really took place for the Russians in 1972, 1977 time frame, where the Russians saw the development of an uh, aircraft we've already done, the AH-56, and went, okay, the Americans are now developing a pure blood attack helicopter. We have to do the same. So they put out uh, a issue to their d design bureaus. And remember, um, design in the Soviet Union was very command and control, they would just go out to uh, good old Uncle Boris at the mill factory and say, okay, here's your spec and this is what we have to build. And that's um, uh, how they started down that path. Now the MI-28 popped out of that as a derivative of the MI-24. The MI-28 has a small um, compartment that can carry three people behind it. but or in it, but it is still classified as an attack helicopter. And, and in that case, what I mean by that is it's, a, it's one of those sharks I talked about. It is not a hybrid aircraft or, let's say, uh, upgun UEs, UH-1s, which the Marines are still flying with miniguns 
and in these hunter killer teams with uh, Z model Cobras, uh, by the way, these Cobra gunships. And, but the, this, uh, we have been gone down a path now where we have really dedicated um, helicopters. It spent a whole bunch of its lifespan. Its first flight was in 1982. It did not get introduced until 2009. So there was a challenge there from 82 to 2009, and that was that it lived in what we want to call development hell. And what was going on there was there were factions, just like what happened with the AH-56 and the Cobra, there were factions within the Russian design bureaus that really favored the uh, KA-50 and wanted the KA-50 to be the primary design. And what ended up happening, the KA-50 was moved up to prominence, won the argument, and the, uh, that happened in 1984. So what they ended up doing, and we are gonna profile the KA-50, so we will get in there, but the idea behind this now is the uh, MI-28 kind of continues to go along in its development process, but it's significantly slowed down. The K-50, as what the Soviet planners felt, was a more aggressive attack helicopter moved to the forefront, and now we're, we're just kind of going along two um, parallel paths. The initial uh, MI-28 production started in uh, 1987, and then an updated prototype flew in 1988, um, it flew at the Paris Air Show in 1989, but then we had a, um, a doldrum where, again, they're kind of just evolving along and they've been upgraded. They keep going through upgraded types. I'm not going to go into each type, but the finally a combat version of the Mi-28 meets, um, meets a combat unit in 2006. So when I talk about development hell, it was development hell. And with that, I'm going to put this on the spindle and the folks that I'm going to salute today, and this is our folks, and that is the combat air crews of these attack helicopters. You got to realize they're flying nap of the earth, against targets that can shoot back. They're relatively slow, let's say 200 miles an hour, and you've got pilots and gunners in these aircraft that are highly, highly skilled. And an Apache detachment, which we are gonna talk about the Apache, they are incredibly lethal. And so today I want to uh, salute all of our uh, our attack helicopter crews and those folks that are specialized in that area because they really are second to none in the world. And what I'm going to do that with, you know, I don't see this before it, before the screening or the taping. Capone, Capone, Capone family secret. I never knew that he made, uh, he made soda, huh? Yeah, there you go. Blue raspberry soda, low sodium, caffeine free. Thinking about my heart. Um, there is a California redemption certificate, so this thing is not that old. Let's look at this. Uh, it's got a, about 130 calories, so kind of high in calorie content. But we'll go ahead and take a pop it off. Oh, it fizzed, which is a good thing. And that means that, that it may not poison me. It actually has a sell-by date on it, too, but I can't see it. So to all of the American attack helicopter aircraft crews, I salute you. And it's blue. Um, that's not bad. It's not antifreeze, which is a good thing. A couple of things you give me. It was pretty much a well, one more second step, which is tradition. All right, so to all those American attack helicopter crews, 
We wish you well. Thank you so much for what you do and your professionalism. So the Havoc made it out. The MI-28 made it out in 2006 to helicopter regiments. And at that point, it, it was pretty dangerous. Greg can throw up a profile of the MI-28. The big, it, it looks similar to the Apache in that it has a big a sighting boom on top of the, the rotor mast. It sits in an armored tub. Now, the crew sits in an armored tub. Now, it has uh, anti-tank, has the Russian helicopters have fairly good sensors. And in Ukraine, uh, the Ukrainians are having a lot of trouble with Russian helicopters standing off and standing outside of their uh, SAM anti-aircraft missile range and basically killing their armored units. Now, the, uh, the thing about this is it also carries a thermobaric weapon. And Russians have used uh, the thermobaric weapons are not really effective against tanks, and if I'm wrong, because this is not the ordnance channel, I expect you to correct me in the comment section, but they are absolutely lethal to soft skin targets. And if you don't know what a thermobaric weapon is, imagine that the missile gets to where it's going, or the bomb, it releases an aerosol or a powder, and then the, it, the, uh, there's something within the missile that detonates that aerosol or that powder. And what you have is this kind of shock wave uh, uh, explosion. Like a, imagine like a, a propane tank. You know how you get, you have propane and you light it and it goes poof? Imagine like that, but it's devastating. It'll uh, do terrible things to your lungs. It's horrible for anybody that's around it. It's horrible to soft skin targets. And, and to be perfectly honest, I, I, I think they should be banned. I think they're as bad as napalm. I, I don't think that it's a weapon that should be used on the battlefield. And, but that's my, my own personal opinion. But the, um, the, the Russians outfit this. They also outfit it with, we talked about heat, anti-tank rounds. Uh, most um, tanks now have reactive armor where they can, we talked about with shape charges and stuff like that, they can deflect the, the round. And so they, the Russians are carrying uh, different anti-tank rounds that have different types of warheads that are de designed to defeat these. And some of those, um, I'm gonna mispronounce this because again, I'm not a tank guy, but Chabam armor or the, it's basically honeycomb armor that's designed to, to take that charge. Um, everybody, there's a big arms race going on right now trying to uh, figure out how to defeat these new anti-tank weapons, but you can rest assured that helicopters are going to be equipped with uh, whatever the latest and greatest thing is to punch through those, that armored set. Um, the other thing is, like most modern attack helicopters, it can carry air-to-air -air as well. So it does have air-to-air uh, -air capability. I believe that the air-to-air -air capability on this is only infrared, though. In other words, heat-seeking missiles, I don't think it has the uh, ability to fire a radar-guided weapon. Uh, now, again, if I'm wrong, correct me, because I'm not an ordnance guy. Um, the Russians, the very low build rate on this aircraft, 126, for the amount of time that they took to develop it, and by the time they got it deployed in 2006, very, very low build rate. As such, they are suffering combat losses. The Russians are in Ukraine. We know of at least three. There may be more. Um, and uh, if you want to read about how you botch, we talked about Air Mobile. Uh, a great read, if you can look it up, is look up something that's open source, not Russians. Uh, about the Battle of Hostomel, which just happened, which you had the Russians at the outset of the Ukrainian war trying to seize the airfield right outside of Kiev, and uh, they got their borscht fed to them pretty bad, and it destroyed a number of their, uh, their airborne units. So read about that. There was, I know, at least one MI-28 shot down in that engagement. So 
it's going to continue to live on. Um, but from a standpoint of development of the airframe, I think that's pretty much it. It's fairly low build. I think uh, the Russians made their decision on the KA-50 and they're going to go down that platform and we're going to see more of that. To be perfectly honest, what you're probably going to see, and I know I'm going to stir up a fight with this, is that most of these systems eventually will be unmanned. They're so dangerous and they're so up close and personal with the enemy that a lot of these will eventually evolve into armed, big armed drones, big armed drone platform systems. Now, if you want to amaze your friends, and by the way, we actually have an MI-28 on this, you can click on the link. Jason will immediately manufacture one of these puzzles. No, he will not, but we do have it in stock, and he will get it out to you, and this one is suitable for framing. So go ahead, do this, put this in your front room, this is military helicopters. And by the way, when I talk about the various types, um, reconnaissance, transport, hunter killers, they're all on here. This actually is, is pretty cool that it, it kind of covers the whole gamut. So reach out to Jason and grab one of those. Now, we cannot do all this. Look at this. Memphis Bell behind me just had its props go back on, and it is in the stages of getting ready to return to the air, which is rather exciting. We can't do all this without your donation. So click on that link, donate a couple of shekels. We could certainly use your donation. If you came across us on YouTube, all we do are one take military aircraft profile videos. If you like that and you can deal with me kind of chomping through it in, uh, in about 15, 16 minutes, uh, give us a subscription and a like. We really appreciate it. Send it to your affectionado that might like uh, the same type of thing, this kind of low production um, uh, military aircraft videos. And then if you come across us on Facebook, give us a comment. Give us a comment on YouTube too. I, like, I really like comments. I like the interaction. I run into a lot of people that see these. We really appreciate it and, and we, we want your comments. Remember, we have the education guides that are also there if you want to click on those things. And, uh, and teach the kiddos at home about flight and about aircraft. We appreciate that. My name is Fred Bell. I am the vice chairman of the Palm Springs Air Museum. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Three, two, one, end of that. Team with a go. Some